Clyde Matthew and this is Ronald and we are here for Point High School. Today we are here at Holyrood to interview First Minister Nicola Sturgeon for BBC School News Report. Let's head in. So firstly, thanks for having us here today. Um, but our first question is to you, uh, what is it like being the first, minister, first female First Minister of Scotland? And how has your life changed since then? Um, it's a big privilege to be First Minister at all, but it's a, an even bigger privilege to be the first female First Minister. So I feel a lot of responsibility on behalf of girls and women all over the country to make sure I, I do the job well. I hope it's not too many years before we see another female First Minister. Uh, my life's changed in some ways not very much because I was Deputy First Minister for a number of years. In other ways it's changed a, a fair bit. It's busier, uh, even busier than it was before. And yeah, there's there's a lot of pressure involved in the job, but so far I'm really enjoying it. What was your inspiration in becoming a politician? Um, teachers at school actually really helped to encourage me to follow my interest in politics. So I had a modern studies teacher at school who, I don't think he was an SNP supporter, but he knew I was really involved in, uh, in, in keen in politics, so he encouraged me to get involved and to do that, uh, and to, just to follow my dreams and follow what, what mattered to me. So that was probably the biggest thing uh, for me and just giving me the confidence to, to do it. I, I was fairly young when I first got involved in the SNP. I was still at school, so the influence of teachers at that time was really important. Uh, so can you tell us about the changes that the SNP have seen since the referendum in September? I think the country's changed hugely since the referendum. Um, the referendum didn't quite go how I hoped it would, obviously. <laughs> But the country is a lot more engaged and empowered. I think people, particularly young people, are a lot more educated about politics and there's much, much more interest. I mean, I, I remember lots of the years I've been involved in politics when you campaign at elections, you know, the biggest challenge usually is to get people who would want to talk to you. And the referendum, and since the referendum, it's the opposite. You know, everywhere you go, people want to talk about politics and about the things that are happening in the country, and that's brilliant. And, you know, I don't think we'll ever, I hope we'll ever go back to a time when people are disinterested and just feel that it doesn't make any difference to vote. I think the referendum really changed all that. How are you, as leader of the SNP, feeling about the upcoming general election? I'm really looking forward to it. Um, we're waiting just now, we're expecting some more opinion polls out later this afternoon, so I'm going to see what that shows. I might be able to tell you more after I've seen them. <laughs> But I, I love elections, I, I love campaigning, I love getting around and talking to people. The SNP is doing really well in the polls just now, so there's every reason for us to be looking forward to this election. Um, but we don't take it for granted, you've got to work really, really hard to win votes in elections. And I guess what we're saying to people is if you want that sense of Scotland being heard and listened to that we had in the referendum to continue, then make sure we send MPs to Westminster that are going to shape it up and make sure that Scotland's interests are protected. What do you foresee or hope for in the general election for Scotland as a whole? I hope we get listened to and I hope we make our mark. All too often Westminster tends to forget about Scotland or ignore Scotland, which to some extent is understandable because we're a relatively small part of the UK. But I hope this time round, after the election, it's not possible for Westminster to ignore us. The, the things that matter in Scotland, you know, health and education, making sure that we have proper investment in these things instead of continued austerity cuts. I hope these things are all up the Westminster agenda and above all else, Scotland's voice is heard. The voting age in Scottish elections from 2016 should hopefully be reduced to 16. What do you feel about the voting age of the general election? I think it's a real shame that it's staying at 18. Um, I think after the referendum and after the big success of 16 and 17 year olds getting to vote and I think everybody thinks it was a success. Not everybody thought it was the right thing to do, but you know, it was wonderful to see so many young people so interested. 
I think the UK government should have decided to lower the age for the general election because if you're, you know, if you were 16 in the referendum and you got to vote, now you're facing an election where you're not going to get to vote, and it's it's just really disappointing that that's the case. But we will get it lowered for the Scottish Parliament elections. The legislation that uh, will make that change should be through the Scottish Parliament by June, and um, so younger people can look forward to getting to vote next year. Uh, so we are from the borders and we'd like to ask a bit about the borders really. Uh, so travel for young people in and out of major cities is really important. So why does the borders railway stop halfway and not con continue to Carlisle? Well, we, the, the decision that was taken was to take the borders rail to Tweed Bank and I think it's a really important and positive step forward and it will be open later this year and I think it's a good thing for the borders and it will help to improve the connections to the borders and it will I think open up the borders much more to tourism for example so I think it's a thoroughly good thing um, and we've been focusing on getting it to that stage um, we've said that we'll do some feasibility work on looking at further extensions um, so we wouldn't rule anything out at this stage uh, but equally it's too soon to rule anything in but you know we'll, we'll look at that over the course of time and see if there's uh, a case an economic case that can be made for doing that yes so we actually conducted our own facebook poll mm -hmm. 98% of people wanted it to come to life where we're from, yeah. so it's quite a really important issue for us. I, I, we had the cabinet um, last year, or the year before, down in, in the borders, and that was a big issue, so I, I don't for a second uh, deny that there's a lot of public support for that. Um, and you know, looking at taking it to Hoyk or further than that will certainly be part of the feasibility work that we're committed to doing. So um, I would encourage people to engage with that when the time comes and to make their voice heard. There's lots of and I'm not saying this is a substitute, but there's lots of car parking at the Tweed Bank station, so it will be possible for people from other parts of the borders to, to travel there, to leave the car and to, to use the train service. So I, I totally accept there's an argument for going further, but I think everybody in the borders will celebrate the fact that the, the railway's back and that it's uh, got to the stage it's going to get to. And the, the opening uh, later this year should be a, a great occasion. Do you think we should will see another independent referendum in our lifetime? Yes. I can't tell you when that will be, <laughs> exactly what age you'll be, but yeah, I do. Um, I think last year's referendum, I think, unleashed something in Scotland that can't be put back in its box. And I think Scotland will become independent. Um, and I think, you know, when that happens, I, I think a, a huge number of people in Scotland will want to, to take that step. But it can only happen when people want it. I can't impose it on people. I can't impose another referendum. So people will have to want that to happen. But I think it will happen. I think there are some things that could happen that speed up the process towards it. You know, so if we end up with a UK government after the election that Scotland hasn't voted for, if they then you know take us out of the European Union when we don't want to be taken out of the European Union, all of these things could have an impact. Uh, our school are trying to introduce iPads for all pupils, but the school is finding it very difficult to fund. Uh, so what do you see as the future of IT ed in education in Scotland? And how in the future will we fund the changing face of education and technology? Well, the Scottish Government just funds local authorities to deliver education and, and fund schools. Um, but IT is a, going to be an increasingly important part of how young people are educated, because that's how young people you know, are used to doing everyday things so the idea of ipads and you know laptops smartphones all the end whatever comes after that because it develops very very quickly that will all be a really important part of how young people learn in the future we've as national government there's a couple of things uh, worth mentioning uh, one is sounds quite technical but we put in place a national framework for local authorities to procure to purchase things like ipads which means that they can get them you know, at the best prices and try to save money that way. There's also some funds that schools can access that are about helping young people that maybe are from more deprived backgrounds uh, access education. Uh, so there are some funds that local authorities and schools can apply to, but you know, by hook or by crook, whatever way we do this, technology is going to become an ever more important part of education. We worry a lot about cutbacks in education. Are you and your government planning to keep funding council budgets so that education services are maintained? We've funded and will continue to fund councils as you know generously as, as we can. 
we're in a position which I wish we weren't in, but we are going out. Our overall budget as the Scottish Government is decided by Westminster. So over the past five years now, we've seen the Scottish Government's budget overall cut, once you take account of inflation, by about 10%. That's a massive reduction in, in anybody's budget. Now, when our budget's reduced by 10%, we're the best world in the world, we can't protect every bit of what we then fund from the impact of that. What we're trying to do is protect the things that you know we think the public think really matter. So we've protected the health service budget because we all need our hospitals and our you know health services there. And we've tried to be as fair to local government as possible. So not that you know this necessarily is the be all and end all, but if you look at how local government's been funded in England compared to Scotland, the kind of cuts that you've seen here are nothing compared to what's been seen in England. We've just done a, a deal with all of the local authorities in Scotland uh, whereby we give them money in the next financial year in turn for them maintaining teacher numbers in our schools because we think having teachers in our schools is so important. So I can't sit here and pretend that when our budget's been cut as much as it has that you know we can take away the pain of that from everybody but we will continue to try and allocate our budget in a way that protects the things that matter and Education is certainly one of the things that really matters. That's a wrap. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Well done, guys. Thank you. Impressive. Everybody can breathe. <laughs> 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 <laughs>